We'll, we'll go ahead and get started. And uh, we're going to keep going in the book of Revelation because, well, maybe tis the season, I don't know, but there's a lot of talk lately about the rapture, the uh, uh, end times, you know, things of this nature. They're popular now and again, and I guess it's now and again. And um, that's part of it, but also in part because, uh, well, because uh, I finally have time to do the, the study that's necessary to be able to bring these lessons, which uh, does take a lot of time, actually, to figure out and to think through and, and uh, bring forward, which I'm not saying um, to brag about it, but to say, yeah, I really have not been able to do this before. And, and I kept thinking, well, how come we weren't able to address this? Uh, uh, I know now why, because it took so long, there was no way to do it <laughs> between that and a, and a full-time job. Uh, but now, um, with the full support of the congregation, which is greatly appreciated uh, and is a great blessing, I hope that this can be a blessing to you, that we have the time to look through these things and bring them forth. Um, the Revelation is a book of the Bible, of course, and is intended, like any other book of the Bible, to be understood. <laughs> it's from God, and it's for us, and it ought to be understood, and it can be understood. And our basic premise, uh, when it comes to interpreting the Revelation, is that it uses symbols, yes, but the symbols are taken from Scripture. And they are known, they are knowable, and they can be found uh, referred to and understood in their original context so that you can understand what they mean in the Revelation as well. They're just figures of speech that are lifted from somewhere else in Scripture that are being compiled in a certain way here in the Revelation for us to use. That's the basic premise, that God did this intentionally, that he might, in some sense, ratify his word by quoting from it in multiple different places and multiple different capacities and compiling that all together into the revelation on the one hand. On the other hand, he intended for us to take the message from it that uh, he put into it. The fact that these symbols have to be interpreted is well established, but that doesn't mean that it's just up to interpretation. You get to do whatever you want with it because it's symbolic. Not so. We know what the symbols are and where they come from, and we can understand what they mean, and we ought to because, well, we owe God that kind of reverence and service. So we're looking at Revelation 21, verse 9, at the bride. There's more than one vision of the bride. There's one at the end of the, um, the last bowl of wrath, the last trumpet, you know, the, the very kind of end of that scroll there. <clears throat> And then there's this one that begins at Revelation 21, 9 and goes all the way down through Revelation 22, uh, 5 or 6, one of those. <coughs> Excuse me. This thing in the throat is just whatever happened on Thanksgiving is still just making me clear my throat. I don't know. Sorry about that. I will try not to do it very often. I'll try to turn away from the microphone. I apologize. Um, Revelation 21.9 is where we find one of the angels that had been speaking with him before uh, with the seven bowls of wrath, etc. Spoke to him again saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. So it introduces that this idea that 21.9 down through 22.5 or 6, I forget which one off the top of my head, is a vision of the bride, the wife of the Lamb. What is the bride, the wife of the Lamb? Well, Ephesians 5 tells us what that is when uh, Paul is writing about it. Thank you. When Paul is writing about that in um, Ephesians 5, it's 25 down to 27. Um, he said, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by washing of water with the word. That's baptism, is it not? So that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And in the end, at verse 32, he said, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying it refers to Christ and the church. What is the bride? 
it's the church. Jesus is married to the, the church, the congregation, the people of God. That's what it is. And it's very clear, I think, in Ephesians 5. It wasn't clear, as Paul said, this mystery is profound. <laughs> it was not something we would have put together necessarily, although you could. It's between the lines and all the prophets. But he's very plain in saying it refers to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, husbands and wives should love one another. <laughs> he finishes out. <laughs> this is kind of, I always chuckle at that. I remember a brother telling me, well, she only has to respect him, but he has to love her. That's not, you know, that's not good enough. <laughs> and I said, you don't even get that, do you, brothers? No, no, I don't. Yeah. yeah, so be it. In truth, it's about the church. That's the point of Ephesians 5. Now, I will say this, because I know um, that's not what a lot of people, what most people think, and maybe even uh, what most people, Christians think. I understand the world doesn't understand this book. They don't get it. They have no shot at understanding it. The Revelation. They have no shot at understanding the Revelation because they don't understand the things that are in plain English. They don't teach baptism for forgiveness of sins. They don't teach an impending judgment of the things done in the body, whether they are good or whether they are evil. Obedience to God in the flesh. They don't teach those things. The things that are in plain English they miss. So they have no chance of understanding the symbols and the symbolism of Revelation. But even in the churches, I think, people don't think this is the meaning. And yet, it's very clear this is the meaning. I think the reason for that might be that people don't realize how valuable the church is. I think that's what it comes down to, really. If, if they understood how valuable the church is, then they could see how this passage describes it. Um, but I think that maybe that's the issue is that w we don't have the kind of appreciation for it that God has for it. And as I think through why that might be, it could be a lot of things, I suppose. Maybe the church is not what we think it should be or what we wish that it would be <laughs> for ourselves or for our families or whatever. Um, or maybe we think that, you know, it's a very poor representation of heaven because it, they're not doing what God wants them to do. It's full of hypocrisy and hypocrites. And, and maybe that's true. That might be true in any given time, in any, any given place. But, you know, uh, the, the, the problem with that kind of thinking is that, well, it's always true that in any time, in any place, it may not be what it should be. People may not be doing what they should be doing, but that's not God's fault. That doesn't reflect on God. And on the other hand, I would say, today is the day of salvation. You know, oh, maybe it's not what it should be. Well, then make it what it should be. <laughs> maybe that it's not doing what God wants it to do. Well, then do what God wants you to do. Advocate for the, you know, from the scriptures. Show what, what is the teaching. Teach yourself. Uh, you, you yourself take on the teaching. Uh, as Malcolm mentioned earlier, if, if you want to pitch in, by all means do so. The church is, is you. It's me. Uh, it's made of us. Today is the day of salvation because, yeah, it may not be what we think it should be or it may not be doing what it ought to be doing. And you know what? That's been true the whole time, ever since Jesus was on the earth. Ever since the apostles were on the earth, it's been like that the whole time. The question is, what are you doing in your time, in your place, with your influence? What you can do in the local place, that's all, that's all that we have. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is the time that you have. This is the church that, that you influence. This, this is the, the chance that we have to make it what God wants it to be. Um, and I say that as a matter of hope. That we don't have to solve uh, all the church's problems in you know, brotherhood papers or anything else. We have to live right ourselves, and we have to be the influence for what is good in the local congregation. And I would say, too, God should be praised for the blessing that is the church that he made for us, that we should be called his children, that we should be called his family. 
that we have forgiveness of sins, that we know truth in Scripture, that we can approach the Creator of the universe in prayer. It's a blessed life to be a Christian. Now, it's not the easiest life. No, nah, it's not without trouble. There's no promises that no matter what. I mean, people prom if anybody promises you no trouble, you know for sure that's trouble. <laughs> what we have to do is to see what the church means to God and see to it that that's what it means to us. I think that's the bottom line of this revelation, really. Why this vision of the bride? Why this vision of the church? We need to come to see what it means to him so that it can mean that to us as well. And we can live like that. <clears throat> so, mechanics. Um, the mechanics of this. This symbol in chapters 21 and 22 of the Revelation comes from a lot of different places in Scripture. As we mentioned before, lots of things are getting quoted and alluded to. I will argue, although I have yet to prove it, I will argue that every book of Scripture is quoted in the Revelation. But this vision of the bride, the wife of the Lamb, is drawn chiefly from three of the prophets, mainly Ezekiel, in his vision of the temple, which is Ezekiel chapters 40 down to 48, <clears throat> at least 48. Um, Isaiah, who speaks about the wife of the Lord um, in 56, I think it is, um, and in other places he speaks of this same uh, holy city. And Zechariah talks about that as well. And these are the... Uh, the main places where these symbols are drawn from. And there were these studies in and of themselves, we're not going to do them this morning. I think the way to do this is to approach the revelation directly, verse by verse, and show where these things are coming from to understand what they mean and why we are coming back to the same conclusion of the value of this thing, that is, God's people. Um, in Revelation 21 to 22, what you're really seeing is the holy city. It's the city of God. And uh, it took me a long time to figure out the structure here, but I think that the structure is this. We first look at the plan of the city, which includes, you know, what's in it, what is, you know, what is not in it. What are its dimensions? How do you describe this thing as it's laid out? How's it laid out? Then there are the materials of the city. What is it made out of? The things that, the construction materials. And then there are the functions of the city. What is carried on there? What is done there? What happens? What is this for? And finally, we look at the citizens. Who is in the city? This is the big picture on these chapters, and we're not going to go through all of them today, or, well, today or this morning. I think we may be able to get one at a time. <laughs> so we'll focus this morning on the plan of the Holy City, which is, uh, starts there at 2110. Uh, it's the first thing in this account that began at 219. Let's look at the plan of the holy city, which is following the temple that Ezekiel described in chapters 40 through 48. <clears throat> in Revelation 21.10, it is written, He carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Well, he said he was going to show me the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Yes, he did. And then he showed me the holy city, the uh, great high mountain and the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. It cannot be heaven. It comes down out of heaven. It's the kingdom of heaven. It's the church. But he said a great high mountain on the one hand, and on the other hand, 
the holy city, Jerusalem. These are exactly what's happening back there in Ezekiel chapter 40. I'm going to turn there. You're welcome to turn with me if you wish. I'll try to read it accurately. But in Ezekiel 40 is where you read the precise day and time <laughs> after the city was struck down that the hand of the Lord was upon Ezekiel in, ch in chapter 40 at verse 1. He said, the Lord brought me to the city. In visions of God, he brought me to the land of Israel and set me down on a very high mountain on which was a structure like a city toward the south because he was towards the north there in captivity. When he brought me there, behold, a man whose appearance was like bronze, with a linen cord, a measuring reed in his hand, and he was standing in the gateway. And the man said to me, Son of man, look with your eyes, hear with your ears, set your heart on all that I will show you. For you were brought here in order that I might show it to you. Declare all that you see to the house of Israel. Uh, you know, immediately... We see from 21.10, the high mountain and the holy city are, in Ezekiel 40, the land of Israel, the very high mountain on which was a structure, like a city. Well, it's clear allusion to this. And we read in Ezekiel how that he was told, Son of man, I brought you here to show you these things so that you can tell them to the children of Israel. How much that sounds like Revelation 1, when it said that God signified these things to his servants, sending it by the hand of John. Very similar, isn't it? That's more than similar, I would say. It's fairly obvious that Revelation is modeled on this. It's what John is doing. The Spirit by John, of course. But that's Ezekiel 40, verses 1 through 4, introduces that topic that you're going to see this holy city. And he lays it out for several chapters following this, as we said, at least down through 48. But we're not going to read those right now. We're going to go to Zechariah for a moment because we're talking about Revelation 21.10, about the high mountain and the holy city. Over in the prophet Zechariah, I'll just take that... <clears throat> chapter 8, just probably that verse 3, where he said to them, ah, Thus says the Lord, I have returned to Zion, I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem will be called the faithful city, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. We'll come back to Zechariah 8 for other things, but for right now, it is enough to demonstrate that both Zechariah and Ezekiel are talking about Jerusalem, the city, which is also the mountain, the holy mountain. So when the Revelation says, he showed me, the whole, uh, a great high mountain and the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. It's clear he's talking about the same thing that Ezekiel talked about and Zechariah talked about, at least. <laughs> there are others. But that sets the stage, and that's why we said we're modeling this, and I'm saying to you after having done this, that as we go through these um, references and we try to find every one of them, you know, you, I just started making the list. You know, here's the reference, here are the verses that it may have come from or that, that refer to such a thing. It became very clear over time as the list was growing and growing that most of them are coming from Ezekiel's closing chapters about the temple. That's the chief symbol. 
The next most common ones are from, Eze uh, from uh, the closing chapters of Isaiah. But Zechariah is very close to both of them. So the next verse there in the Revelation. 21, 12, we begin to talk about the, uh, the wall. There are a couple of different aspects about the wall. If we are talking about the plan of the city, there's a couple of different aspects. There's both gates in that wall and there are foundations underneath that wall. So it's kind of the, the, uh, the appearance, if you will, the appearance of the city from the outside. It had a great high wall with 12 gates. Let's skip a little. And on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed, says Revelation 21, 12. Yep, it's got 12 gates. And the gates have the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. Well, that's interesting. Because if you look back at Ezekiel 48, which is, in fact, the last chapter of Ezekiel, that's why I chuckled about 40 through at least 48. <laughs> it is the last chapter of Ezekiel. <coughs> In the 30th through the 35th verses of that chapter... are the last verses of the prophet Ezekiel. These shall be the exits of the city on the north side, which is to be 4,500 cubits by measure, three gates, gate of Reuben, gate of Judah, gate of Levi, gates of the city being named after the tribes of Israel. On the east side, which is 4,500 cubits, three gates, gate of Joseph, gate of Benjamin, gate of Dan. On the south side, 4,500 cubits by measure, three gates, gate of Simeon, Issachar and Zebulun on the west side, 4,500 cubits, three gates of Gad, of Asher, and of Naphtali. The circumference of the city, 18,000 cubits. The name of the city from that time on shall be, the Lord is there. That's interesting. <laughs> the name of the city is the Lord is there. Hmm. But here we see the gates of the city are named after the gates of the, or after the tribes of Israel. So it's the same thing. When the revelation said it was the great high mountain, the city of God, the, the, the city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, and it said its wall has 12 gates on which are 12 tribes of Israel, Ezekiel said it was a great high mountain and a structure like a city, the city of God, and that it had 12 gates, the gates being named after the tribes of Israel. It's clear that the revelation is referring to Ezekiel's vision. A city whose name is the Lord is there. In the 14th verse of Revelation 21, going on about the wall, we look at the foundations. It said the foundation, or the wall of the city, had 12 foundations, actually. On these were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. That's an interesting thing. Foundations of the city. Twelve apostles of the Lamb. Well, Ephesians 2 says as much. If you recall, beginning in verse 19 down through verse 22 of Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, 19. You are no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. That's interesting. 
It's a temple. Well, that's what Ezekiel said, isn't it? <laughs> and you're being built into a dwelling place for God. But Ezekiel said the name of that city is the Lord is there. Oh, wait, that's, that's consistent too, isn't it? Yeah, that's very consistent. And Ephesians 2, especially at verse 20, says, built on the foundation of the apostles. Now, Jesus is the, the cornerstone, of course. He's the most important thing here. But the, the foundation of the apostles is very much a New Testament idea, something that they said. And over at 1 Corinthians 3, Paul said this, very directly, not just in the reference there at uh, Ephesians saying that the whole thing was being built on top of a foundation which was the apostles, though Jesus is the chief. In 1 Corinthians 3, he tells them directly that his work there at Corinth, similar to the work of Apollos, was precisely at verse 10, according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. And someone else is building on top of it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than what has already been laid down, which is Jesus Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 and 11. The Apostle Paul said, I laid a foundation... As a wise master builder, not that he's so smart, but that he has the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's the wise master builder. That's the architect is God. And he laid a foundation. What foundation? It's Jesus Christ. It's what Ephesians said, that though the apostles are the foundation, Christ himself is the chief cornerstone. No one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid. It's Christ Jesus. That's what the apostles did. The 12 apostles are the foundation. Yes, as he said, I laid it. But what is it? It's Christ. Their teaching is the teaching of Christ, not their own. That's the foundation of the city. Yes, it is. That's how the city is founded. We are accomplishing the things the apostles wrote down. When you talk about the plan of the city, you talk also about the dimensions of the city in Revelation 21 at verse 15. The one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and its walls, which is an interesting thing because as we read in Ezekiel 40 and verse 3, there was a man with a measuring reed in his hand. It's interesting to me that the revelation at 21.15 has a measuring rod made out of gold. <laughs> that thing is solid and made out of gold. Whereas in Ezekiel, the measuring rod was, or was not a rod, it was a reed. You know, a very temporary, uh, you know, not a long-lasting kind of thing. And in Isaiah 60, verse 17, which I'll quote to you, it says, instead of bronze, I will bring gold. Instead of iron, I will bring silver. Instead of wood, bronze. Instead of stones, iron. Everything is upgraded in the kingdom of God. That's the idea. But just like the plan of Ezekiel had uh, somebody there with a measuring reed going around measuring everything and revealing the dimensions, so also in the Revelation, the city as it appears in 21 and 22 of Revelation is being measured by a rod, by the servant of God, the, the angel, the messenger. Also, with regard to the dimensions of the city, in Revelation 21, 16, it lies four square. It's length the same as its width. Length and width are equal. And I don't remember, I was never all that familiar with the teaks, to be honest with you, but those of you that are teachers know when do they learn that a square has equal sides. <laughs> it's pretty early. Might be first grade. Um, <clears throat> But the four square idea is the length and the width are the same, and in fact, its height is the same. It's a cube. But the dimension of it being four square is also consistent with the vision of Ezekiel's temple, where in chapter 48, you, ha you have these dimensions given in verse 20. 
where they combine both the holy or the sacred district and the district that was meant for the common use into a, a complete part, which is 25,000 cubits square. It's 5,000 to each side. And you may remember uh, something about the gates being 4,500. That's because they only left <laughs> a small portion for the people. 80% of the place was for the Lord. But the whole portion of it is square. The holy portion together with the property of the city. The, the city of God in Ezekiel is square. It was made that way. It was given that way. Not that there's significance to 25,000 or to cubits, but that there's significance to the fact that its dimensions are equal. And this is also quoted in the Revelation, telling us again, we're talking about Ezekiel's temple. I'll skip a little bit on the plan into chapter 22, which was an editorial decision. Um, but I will. Um, in Revelation 22, in verse 1, the angel also showed me the river of the water of life bright as crystal, flowing from the throne. And I chose to put this here because it's part of the structure of the city, the plan of the city, and it also is a direct reference to Ezekiel's temple. It, Revelation 22, 1 said, there's a river of the water of life flowing from the throne. Ezekiel 47 is where this comes from where it says, he brought me back to the door of the temple and behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple toward the east because the temple faced east. And the water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar and brought me out by way of the north gate, led me around the outside, the outer gate that faces the east and behold, the water, the water was trickling out at the south end, but going south, going eastward with a measuring line, he measured a thousand cubits and led me through the water and it was ankle deep. Another thousand cubits and it was knee deep. Another thousand and it was waist deep. Another thousand and it was a river I couldn't pass through for the water had risen deep enough to swim in. A river couldn't be passed through. He said, son of man, have you seen this? He led me back to the bank of the river and I went back and saw trees on every side. He said, this water flows toward the eastern region, goes to the Arabah, enters the sea. When the water flows into the sea, the water becomes fle uh, fresh wherever the river goes. Verse 9, Ezekiel 47. Every living creature that swarms will live. There will be very many fish. This water goes there. The waters of the sea may become fresh. Everything will live where the river goes. Fishermen will stand beside the sea. From En Gedi to En Eglime, it will be a place for the spreading of nets. Its fish will be very many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. It's like a fisherman who put down a net and drew up fish of all, many different kinds, isn't it? The kingdom of God. Somebody said that, I can't remember who. Oh, yes, it was Jesus. That's right. But in Ezekiel's vision, water issued forth from the temple and gave life everywhere that it went. And Jesus himself said the kingdom of God is like this, referring back to the same thing. Continuing in Revelation 22, remember it said on verse 2, on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. That's Revelation 22, verse 2. But if we go back here in Ezekiel 47 and finish, it says in the 12th verse, on the banks, on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor will the fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month, 
because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. So both sides of the river, fresh fruit every month, leaves for healing. Let's see, Revelation said, either side of the river, tree of life, 12 kinds of fruit, yielding fruit for each month, leaves of the tree for the healing of the nations. Ah, yep, that, that checks out, doesn't it? It's Ezekiel 47, 12. The other thing that's part of the plan of the city is that the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it. Revelation 22, 3, the throne of God, the throne of the Lamb, the throne that belongs to both God and the Lamb is in it. That is where God's throne is, Revelation 22, 3. And Ezekiel 43 said the same thing. I do want to read Ezekiel 43, and then we're done. But Ezekiel 43, verses 7 through 12, also describes this as the place of God's throne. But I would like to read it because it tells you something. It tells us why this vision. What is this for? What's the intended application? Ezekiel 43, verses 7 through 12. <clears throat> He said to me, well, uh, verse 6, really, the, it says, I heard one speaking to me out of the temple. Son of man, this is the place of my throne, the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the people of Israel forever. And the house of Israel will no more defile my holy name, neither they nor their kings, by their whoring, by the dead bodies of their kings of their high places, by setting their threshold by my threshold, their doorposts by my doorposts with only a wall between me and them. They've defiled my holy name by their abominations that they have committed, so I've consumed them in my anger. Remember, he speaks to Ezekiel in captivity, in exile. That's how you ended up here. They defiled my name, so I've consumed them in my anger. Let them put away their whoring and the dead bodies of their kings far from me, and I'll dwell in their midst forever. As for you, son of man, verse 10, describe to the house of Israel the temple that they may be ashamed of their iniquities, and they shall measure the plan. And if they're ashamed of all that they've done, then make known to them the design of the temple, its arrangements, its exits, its entrances, that is to say, its whole design, and all its laws, write it down in their heart, or in their sight, so that they may observe all its laws and its statutes and carry them out. This is the law of the temple. The whole territory on the top of the mountain, all around, will be most holy. Behold, this is the law of the temple. See what he's getting at? It is God's. It is holy. It's to be treated as holy. It has a plan, it has a design. And if we care to put away our iniquities from ourselves and serve him, then he will show us that plan and he will show us that design. That's how we make him the king in our hearts. And it becomes the place of his throne. This is the point of Ezekiel's vision. This is the reason that it forms the basis of the revelation for the plan of the holy city. The church is the temple of the Lord. He dwells among us. He calls us to holiness. We put away our iniquities from us and ensure that we serve him faithfully with wholehearted devotion. And he has a plan that he's laid it out in, a design, a purpose that it serves his purposes. It's the city of God. It's a great blessing to be a part of this thing. And I hope that that is a useful start for you. Um, there are other passages that, that we'll uh, look at together 
and uh, hopefully we'll have a chance at the next opportunity to look at the next part of the structure that is there, composition materials. But these things are, are brought forth for you to see that indeed the bride, the wife of the lamb is the city of God. It's the church. It's valuable to him. It's important to him. It's something he cherishes. It's something he has a plan for. It's a place for his dwelling. It's a place that should be held as holy and a place where we can live if we put away our iniquities, if we put away the service of human things and human ideas and human religion. Well, today, are you a part of that kingdom? Are you a citizen in the city of God, in the church that belongs to Christ? What does that take? Well, you believe in the Lord. You believe in the resurrection of the dead as he sent his son Jesus to die in our place to be the king, the anointed. That's what Christ means. He's the anointed. He's God's choice of king. He is the king over this kingdom. And we did not esteem him, and we did not treat him right, and, and he died because of our sins and our trespasses. But he also died because it was God's purpose. He knew that he would save us by this, and that, he, that this son would become the offering for sins and the means by which we could be forgiven and reconciled to him. And he intends for us to be reconciled to him and to come into this city and to live this blessed life. So today, if you're not a Christian, become a Christian. Put him on in baptism for forgiveness of sins. Put to death the old person to be resurrected a new person in Christ Jesus, created in him for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's also Ephesians 2. If today you are a Christian but haven't lived right, repent. Make things right with God. Let us pray with you if we can, because we all need prayers. We pray for one another. I can practically guarantee that whatever it is you are struggling with, somebody else has seen it, somebody else has struggled with it, we'll pray for one another. But think about the value that God places on the church and the plan that he has for it and the purpose that he has for it. And make that the reality in your own life, that he might be the king in your heart. If you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized, let it be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.